What could $5 trillion buy us? And why a grid will remain important regardless of what we do in the future? Transport Evolved, a channel by Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, is predominantly aimed at aggregating and dispersing positive news and views regarding future vehicles. So naturally, the occasional all praise musk can be heard. About three weeks ago, the host decided to talk about Puerto Rico and Musk's boasting about him being able to rebuild the grid and power the island with solar and batteries. Let's see what she has to say about it. But while this all goes on, Tesla CEO Elon Musk, who has personally donated a quarter million dollars to aid efforts in Puerto Rico, has done something that you might have not even heard about that will not only impact the island nation in the coming months, but also in the coming years. He's sent hundreds of Tesla Powerwalls to Puerto Rico, where teams of Tesla engineers will collect them to existing solar panel systems to not only give residents power as quickly as possible, but also to ensure that they have a way of storing power even if the island's electrical grid lies in ruins. Also take note of this remark. Earlier this year, Joshua D. Rhodes of the University of Texas at Austin calculated that the U.S. electrical grid, which is in some places as decrepit as Puerto Rico's was pre-Maria, would cost five trillion U.S. dollars to replace, equivalent to around one third of the nation's GDP for one year. Or to put it another way, nearly fifteen and a half thousand dollars for every one of the 323 million people living in the U.S. today. Imagine putting that much investment into a distributed power generation and storage system. So let's be clear. I don't think that it can be done, and I doubt that it is wise to do so. Let me elaborate. First, I think that a better grid needs to be built. Whatever you do on that island will always be overshadowed by the fact that the extant grid is too vulnerable. Then there's the idea that you could go off-grid. Fine. What happens if the entire neighborhood has no more roofs or the solar panel infrastructure has been damaged? You still have a problem. Recent events in the Caribbean have shown that grids and solar infrastructure and windmills are very vulnerable indeed. And this begs the question, is adding more of the same going to provide resilience? Perhaps on a personal level, yes. But when it comes to making sure a community can function, I think the answer is quite the opposite. It gives a false sense of security and is being sold off as a superior alternative to centralized, robust energy generation and modern, well-kept, well-thought-out and resilient grids. Resilience is a function of design, but we also have to consider feasibility in both economic as well as material terms. And this last item tends to be brushed over rather easily. First, we have to consider the fact that Puerto Rico, as a part of the United States, may be considered rather wealthy compared to other countries. So they will have more means to fix the damage wrought on the island by the hurricanes. So this means that they can afford so-called luxury solutions, the ones that are being offered by Elon Musk. And that's something most of the people pushing for 100% renewable don't realize. These are luxury solutions. The poor and destitute of this world in countries that are still developing are looking for natural gas and coal to pull them out of poverty. And don't get me wrong, the hardship of the people of Puerto Rico is real. They've been through some really rough times where they've seen a lot of destruction, lost their homes and perhaps even loved ones. The, the aftermath of a tropical hurricane is no laughing matter. As to why renewable advocates like to bring up the but it requires a grid defense against anything other than wind and solar or water power is still unclear to me. The refutation should be childishly easy. Consider wind energy for instance. It doesn't make any sense without a distribution grid. So they prop up the magical smart grid as if that somehow constitutes something entirely different. And all this vague argumentation around grids 
made me realize just how interesting it would be to make some simple diagrams and add some context, just to show you how hollow the but it requires a grid argument really is. We will keep it simple at first, but we will make some calculations later on. So here we see a very simple depiction of a grid. On the left hand side we see the energy generation and high voltage transmission part and to the right you see the low voltage distribution ending up somewhere between 100 and 250 volts at the plug in your home. I'm used to 220 volts in the Netherlands. The power plant generates electricity and this electricity has to be passed down all the way to the end user to enable some kind of work. So how does it get to the end user? First, at the switchyard next to the power plant, the voltage of the electricity gets jacked up to somewhere around 400,000 volts or 400 kilovolts. This stepping up and stepping down of voltage happens in transformers. If you paid attention in physics class, way back when you were still in school, you know that it basically looks like this. A core of metal with a primary and a secondary coil wound around it. A current flows through the primary coil. This coil then creates a magnetic field. And the flux of this field moves through the metal core. The reverse happens on the other end. The magnetic field flux from the core passes through the secondary coil and it creates a current. If the secondary coil has more turns than the primary, the voltage goes up and vice versa. So why do we need these transformers in a grid? Generally speaking, a big power plant such as say a thousand megawatt electric nuclear power plant probably isn't near to where the end users need their energy. It is not unlikely that one power station supplies electricity to multiple cities or villages dispersed over a large area. The point with electricity is that it has to travel through a medium. We're talking mainly about copper and aluminium wires which are conductive. If we would maintain say 220 volts, the wires through which the electricity has to travel has resistance, which means that the electricity heats the wire up. This means that you will lose energy during transmission. However, if you can step up the current from 220 volts to say 400 kilovolts, you will lose less energy. Let's look at it from a mathematical viewpoint, shall we? First, we are going to figure out how many amps we will have. And secondly, we are going to figure out how much power is lost running this electricity through an aluminium cable of say 1000 meters and a diameter of one centimeter. First, we use this equation. We have 10,000 watts delivered at 220 volts and this gives us 45 amps. This has to travel for one kilometer. So how much resistance does the wire have? To determine this, we need the following equation. The resistivity of aluminium at 20 degrees Celsius is 2.65 times 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters. The length of the wire is 1000 meters. And let's say that the typical cross section for such an aluminium wire is one centimeter. So we solve for R. So how much do we lose? So 0 0.33741 times 45 amps squared is 683 watts loss. That's a loss of 6.83%. So in the end, your transmission line delivers 9,317 watts of power at 220 volts. Now let's jack up the voltage to say 400,000 volts and see what happens. 
even if we would increase the length of the cable by a factor of 1000, you'd still only lose 0.21%, less than a percent of what you initially have invested. But then, of course, there's losses down the road as well. Transformation isn't perfect, for instance. And do note that there's still kilometers of copper wiring in there that have to carry much lower voltages. So you might end up losing as much as 10% of all the energy you put in the grid. Especially if someone's at the end of a very long route with a lot of substations along the road. And that's the reason why we use such high voltages when transmitting electricity over long distances, especially when we are talking about billions or even trillions of watts. Then the losses without transforming the voltage would become so large that we couldn't afford it anymore. But that's not an argument against a grid. It's merely to point out how a grid functions and why certain elements are in there. So now we return to my simple grid topography. What you see here is just one of a gazillion different possibilities. For instance, heavy industry sits as close to the point where the transmission turns into distribution and it often needs higher voltage than your average home. The point being here is that you need different sets of infrastructure for different purposes. So what is a smart grid going to do? How much smarter than our current grid will it be? I think it is rather vague and presumptuous to see that needing a grid is a bad thing and that a smart grid is going to fix anything. Redundancy is the most basic means of building in resiliency to accidents and other mishaps. Enter the renewable fantasy. People buy solar panels so that they can generate their own electricity and in order to be safe when it becomes dark. They also have a battery to store some excess charge. But that's not enough. No, some want to have a return on their investment. So they want to sell their direct current electricity back to the grid. But that's a problem because the grid runs on alternating current and not on direct current. So they need an inverter to turn their DC electricity into AC electricity that could be sold back to the grid. Apart from that, they need this inverter anyway because most of the appliances at home don't, work, don't run on DC power. So now we have the following situation. Half of the people invested in the solar electric house extras and the other half haven't. Heavy industry, like for instance a steel recycling facility, hasn't invested because they need megawatt scale solutions. And buying it from the grid is cheaper than building and maintaining such a facility themselves. Also, this isn't what their company is about. They don't have the expertise. They don't have the capital. So, it probably doesn't make any sense to begin with, as they are operational around the clock all year long. This begs the question, is this a reliable alternative to centralized power production and the use of high voltage transmission lines. And do note that PV farms and wind farms require big grid connections too. And if you want to sell your precious solar electricity back to the grid, well, it's handy to have a grid, isn't it? You could start filling up 12 volt AA batteries, but that would be rather pointless. No, this grid argument is rather duplicitous. People who use this argument have either no grasp of basic electrical engineering principles or they are lying through their teeth. Fairy dust doesn't activate civilization but raw power does. Also, on a civilizational scale having some PV on your roof doesn't really mean anything at all. It might make you happy as an individual, but those who cannot participate in this, with all due respect, grotesque upper-class moral energy fuckery shouldn't pay the price for it. And that's where we are headed right now. This isn't what energy democracy looks like. This is energy bourgeoisie. The new upper-class is those who want and can participate in the solar panels, Tesla, batteries and wind will save it all madness and expect the rest of us to follow. 
I will call them new airheads. I'm sorry, sometimes frustration gets the best of me. This is my channel after all. Back to Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. What could we do with five trillion dollars if not repair a faltering electricity grid by re remodeling it and thus making it more resilient? In all honesty, you would get roughly 1100 gigawatts of solar for that money. I hate to break it to you, we need more than 10 times that in the most optimistic scenario and that's not accounting for transformation, transmission, storage and inversion. 1100 gigawatts sounds like a lot, but guess again, even according to the most optimistic appraisal, a near fully electrified civilization will require roughly 42,000 gigawatts of renewable capacity. But that's not all. Suppose someone would say, well, what if you would only spend this money on the US? Even then, you'd be short another 5,500 gigawatts. According to the most optimistic appraisal which has been presented to the public by Mark C. Jacobson, who, by the way, doesn't want anyone to use the scientific method while assessing his plan, or else he will sue them. And if you think that all of this is so-called gridless fantasy energy, you are wrong. All of it will be interconnected in a web that spans the globe. Transmission and distribution of energy are perhaps as important as generating it in the first place. We need electricity and particularly energy for everything we do. It's time we stop fooling around. The electricity grid may be old and centralized energy distribution may have its own problems. But it was, is and will remain vital for mankind for decades, perhaps even millennia to come. The most important aspects in a, if not fully electrified future, are a well-maintained and well-designed power grip that works on all levels. Resiliency through redundancy will be one of the cornerstones in a prosperous future for mankind. Now don't get me started about swapping the idea of rebuilding a critical piece of infrastructure for some personal luxury fantasies. And that's it for this week's rant. I'm sorry, my blood is boiling at this moment. Have a nice day.